For nearly two years, Christopher Eccleston has been playing the Ninth Doctor for Big Finish Productions. He's returned to the role in the audio medium. We're now at the series finale for Series 2, Doctor Who at the Ninth Doctor Adventures, Shades of Fear, which takes a colour-coordinated approach to its stories. We've got a trilogy here. We've got The Colour of Terror by Lizzie Hopley, which is a modern-day contemporary story. We've got The Blooming Menace by James Kettle, which is set in uh, early 20th century uh, England. And we've got Red Darkness by Roy Gill, which is a space-faring sci-fi story featuring the Vashta Narada. Like what's been happening with recent Ninth Doctor stories, they've been pairing him up against established villains like we've had the Sontarans, we've had the Cybermen, we've also now got the Vashta Narada. And this is also a box set which stars Adam Martin in Red Darkness. I did a, uh, an interview with him last week. Uh, YouTuber, Hootuber Adam Martin, AMTV, uh, did an interview with him last week. Check out that video if you want to learn more about that role, but it was a really good chat. So yeah, let's talk about the Shades of Fear. So firstly, we've got The Colour of Terror by Lizzie Hopley, which um, starts off with the Doctor finding his way inside of a London-based charity shop. The TARDIS uh, materialises inside of one of the changing rooms. And you've got Mrs. Bevel, who runs it, played by Susan Penhaligon. So you've got him in this, uh, in this charity shop, but one of the patrons there has recently disappeared after wearing a big, colourful red dress. She goes into the changing room and never comes back out again, but the dress still remains. Basically, it's a little bit like that horror film, the A24 film in Fabric, but there's also a comparison to be made for the 10th Doctor story, Midnight, because it's essentially a bottle base under siege story where this cast of eclectic characters find themselves trapped inside of this charity shop because there's some creature that is using the red on the colour spectrum to try and communicate and to try and hop from item to item. That's where we get the Shades of Fear theming here. It's the colour red that the Doctor and his friends have to be afraid of. Let's play a clip from The Colour of Terror. Doctor! The post box just exploded! Of course it did. My ginger did this. Possibly if the Mameen, whoever or whatever they are, communicate through light waves, well, waves travel. The me? I know. Never heard of them either. Them? Aliens. A race of artificial intelligence, perhaps? Or just another life form, but capable of interdimensional travel and somehow trapped in your colour spectrum. Oh, OK. <laughs> is on fire. Yet the flowers in this hanging basket are frozen solid. <laughs> that man's trying to walk a different way from his coat. They're experimenting with energy transitions. The Vermeen are trapped in the red spectrum and they're trying to jump free. They're using the colour as stepping stones. Watch. From the post box to the phone box. To the man. To the traffic light. All stemming from one place. Mrs. Mrs. Bevel's shop. <laughs> So it's a really cool concept, and one of the cast members being um, being touted in this set is Frank Skinner, who plays Pete. In that clip, he references my ginger. That's his tabby cat, Ginger, who, because of the colour of the cat, does wind up communicating uh, with the species that are using the red colour spectrum. And the cat ends up talking, and it's very freaky, and it's very cute as well. But yeah, so this has got a really good cast of characters. There is some, what you would expect with the Ninth Doctor Adventures, there's some class consciousness here. You've got Mrs. Bevel, who's this upper tea, upper class owner of this charity shop who gives other charity shops in the area fake reviews, and she's willing to do like a don't ask don't tell type policy when it comes to people who go into the shop and don't come out like did you see them leave did you see them try on the dress like plausible deniability just so that she doesn't have a bad reputation in the shop whereas everybody else who comes into the shop as the supporting characters they are the downtrodden the uh they are the the working class they are the the outsiders of society you've got one character here who's recently been released from prison and the doctor just does not care like the at one point he tries to open up emotionally to the doctor like but if we're going to be doing this you need to be able to trust me so i need to be able to tell you this and the doctor doesn't blink he doesn't care he's like i don't care what your past was you're here helping us now and you're clearly a good person that stuff is really really good it's a really good bottle episode set in this charity shop it's a really good setting as well where there's so much character to be found in this setting and it's just a really great down-to-earth one in one of the last ninth doctor adventures we had the idea of a i think it was flat pack written by john dorney where it's set in 
essentially an ikea furniture store like that's just a really cool setting to have a horror monster based under siege story and mrs bevel's charity shop is a similar vibe here as well and the there's some fun use of the color red even if you're not able to see it um be visualized because it's the audio medium there's still some really fun and interesting visual gags if that makes sense what they do with the tardis you know when you think of the color red and the villain is the color red you know you're gonna do that with the tardis that's all i'll say there's a really really great reveal in regards to a puzzle box which is really clever i found that really fun and how they basically just use paint to try and um, to try and stop uh, the vermine which is the species that are able to communicate um, and travel on the red wavelength of the color spectrum really cool idea really really well applied with a rich eclectic cast of characters mrs bevel is a character who you just you bloody love to hate. I, the actress plays it so well. The character's so obnoxiously written, but in a good way. Like, you love to hate this character. It's a little bit broad with its moralizing. Like, of course, the upper, to, the upper class, upper tea charity shop owner is the villain. And, of course, the like the downtrodden are the, the, are the really good guys. And there's very little moral ambiguity to be found here. But it's still done really, really well. This is something that I would, honestly, it would be really good to adapt this for tv proper this does feel like a story that you could have in the revived series and it would translate really really well but because it is eccleston because he is the ninth doctor where there is that class consciousness undercurrent throughout the whole thing like he's the northerner with the leather with the battered leather jacket it all works really really well i've said it with other series two box sets that many of the stories kind of feel like this could be any doctor in these adventures however with the shades of fear box sets i can't really say that here the ninth doctor fits so well amongst these characters interacts so well with all of them across all three stories this does feel like a box set which you couldn't really tell with any other doctor without drastically rewriting the dynamics of the characters the ninth doctor and eccleston in general fits really really well in the shades of fear and that comes to the forefront in the color of terror i don't think the color of terror is the best of the three in this box set but i've got to be honest it is my favorite like this is the one where i can imagine oh i've got an hour to spare i want a fun ninth doctor adventure i'm gonna listen to the color of terror it's really easy listening even if it's not a insubstantial listen there's a lot of good character work here a lot of great dynamics here but it's really easy listening very easy to recommend if these were released as just standalone stories the color of terror would be my like go-to one really good easy listening the other one is the blooming menace by james kettle this is the obligatory historical story where the ninth doctor finds himself in a 1920s gentleman's club where he um unwittingly becomes the valet to turn Toby and Whistle, who's played by Dave Herm. Toby is like the owner of this big, elaborate, massive estate which hosts gentlemen's clubs. However, there is a big threat encroaching London and also a threat encroaching the Fellows Bachelor Club because they're all falling in love and getting married. But what are they getting married to? Let's play a quick clip from The Blooming Menace. Bullstrode! Hello, Ed Whistle. Were you expecting me? Crumbs. We were supposed to go to the theatre tonight, weren't we? That new play, No Flowers for Big Bertha. I do love Chekhov. Oh, I can't come to the theatre tonight, Ed Whistle. I'm otherwise engaged. <laughs> do you know, that's a good way of putting it. Toby, stay back. Hey, steady on. I know you'll think me a frightful fool. Head over heels. I suppose you think it's never going to happen until it does. Bullstrode, what has your legume-sized brain led you into? Don't let it in. I'm so keen for you to meet her. Every time I see her, I can't look at anything else. That's what Wicker Basket said. Good grief, Bullstrode. It's another one of those awful plants. She's exquisite. That thing's not from this planet, and I've already seen what it can do. Keep away from the tendrils. Tendrils? The thin, windy bits. I think she likes you. Bullstrode, you're off your rocker. I'm so glad you're happy for us. He doesn't seem to be taking in what I'm saying. Well, it's the same with all of them. You need to think about settling down, Ed Whistle, old man. It's a different life. Better. He's hypnotised. Sort of. It's filling up all of his thoughts. 
No good. This thing doesn't work on botany. Can't we chop it down or something? Oh, that's great. That's the human race, that is. When in doubt, murder. I just feel so complete. And it's dangerous. I saw an old cabbie go at one of these with a fire axe on Leicester Square. Tendril shot out and throttled him before he could get a swing in. If you've listened to my Ninth Doctor Big Finish reviews in the past, you'll see a trend develop where the second installment of these trilogies I kind of take or leave it kind of feels like a, the historical throwaway story I, I'm just not a big fan of the Ninth Doctor historicals in these Ninth Doctor sets but I think out of all of the ones from the recent box sets the Blooming Menace is probably my favorite one and it's actually a really fun listen. One thing that really sort of st uh, stood out to me in The Blooming Menace by James Kettle, I don't know if it's just the way that the script was written, or maybe Ian Meadows, who does the sound design and does some of the edit uh, does some of the sound editing for these sets, whether or not he just did a much tighter edit or something, but something about the dialogue and the speed of The Blooming Menace, it, it's very, very snappy, very, very punchy dialogue, and that made this so memorable. There's like, I won't give them now it's been like a week and a half since i listened to the blooming menace so my memory's not the best with it but there's so many great lines some of them just so throwaway that you you almost have to like go back a few seconds and be like did i did i hear that correctly did that happen so fun so punchy i think james kettle's dialogue here really sparkles i think the whole cast do a great job delivering those lines as well and you know like i said the punchiness the overlapping of the dialogue sometimes really gives the blooming menace a really distinct identity one cast member that really sticks out here, though, is Malinka Brooks, who plays Phil, who's trying to get into the gentleman's club, but is so obviously a woman. And that the story has a lot of fun with that dynamic. Malinka Brooks is really fun in the role. I think that Phil and the Doctor have the best back and forth and the rapport of the story. Although, to be fair, I loved the Doctor's interplay with Toby as well, how he has no idea how to be a good valet. Somebody knocks at the door and the Doctor doesn't answer and Toby's like, you're my valet, What? What? You mean, you're meant to have answered the door by now. And the Doctor just does not care, D like doesn't understand the dynamic at play. Even though this is the job he may have possibly signed up for, he does not know if he's currently being interviewed for it. It's, it's really good. Uh, there's too many villain toby's immediate oh no toby's the good guy toby's the guy who like he's not perfect he's like he's he's running a gentleman's club in the 1920s he's not perfect but he is the companion surrogate in this story he's 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 like the second he's the second lead in this he's a good toby um tfl great leader he's he's one of the good ones if there is a, a weak point with the blooming menace though it is the plant threat the doctor and one other character they do try to open the bud on the top and then it instantly like wilts and dies and the moment that happened i was like okay i know why this has happened and the story gives a like a, a pretty big mystery that it dangles in front of the listener for like a good 20 or 30 minutes after that when personally i predicted it the moment it happened but maybe that's just i've listened to too many of these sets maybe this is a me issue i don't know but the actual threat of the plants of the botany not only is it basically a retread of black orchid from the uh, from season 21 i just didn't find it that compelling a threat even though like conceptually it's interesting but like i said it's just black orchid again but the dynamic between the main characters the doctor toby and phil and the the rest of the characters at the fellows club really really sparkling great dialogue great performances across the board like i said it's the class consciousness that you get in these ninth doctor adventures where you've got the working class northern and ninth doctor going into this extravagant gentleman's club in the 1920s and he has no idea how and he has no idea what the etiquette is in these situations it's it's a good listen this is probably one of the better ninth doctor historicals of the whole big finish range it was a good listen i enjoyed the blooming menace a lot i don't quite know how it works with the color theming though because in the shades of fear box set you've got um the threat in the color of terror of red in Red Darkness, once again, you've got the colour red, which is the threat. For the Blooming Menace, yeah, you know, you get botany, you get plant life, you get green, but it's it just seems like a little bit of a tenuous link, to be honest. But still, Blooming Menace, even though it's, uh, you know, I don't really think it understood the assignment in terms of the colour threats, still a good listen. I enjoyed this. 
But the standout, the premiere story, uh, the big, uh, much-hyped return of the Vashta Narada, and the season two finale is Red Darkness by Roy Gill. You've got this colony off-world in the distant future, and you've got Callan Lennox, played by Adam Martin, who is a partially sighted teenager who is, uh, who's got a family on the colony who do farming and they do scavenging. And you've also got Doyle, who is a very obedient, lovely dog, played by Harky Bambra, who is able to communicate via a collar a telepathic collar, much like Doug from the Pixar film Up, and I know that's the most boring comparison I could make, but it is the most appropriate one. However, the planet is being besieged by the Vashta Narada, and not only that, but there's another entity on the planet which, commu uh, which is able to travel through the darkness and the sunlight, and it is able to meld with the Vashta Narada to become the titular Red Darkness. So it's not just the Ninth Doctor facing off against the Vashta Narada, it's an evolved form of the species that's much more powerful. But Let's play a clip from Red Darkness. What's he doing? What is that? That hurts my ear stick. He's waving it about. Not a stick, it's my sonic. Works like a key or a scanner. I thought I told you to stay. Doyle failed basic obedience training. I believe that. What's your excuse? Okay, stand back. Cabin's empty. Driver's seat's still warm. No trace on the ground. So he never got out. No markers of teleport displacement, no biological remnants. What else can you send? Ooh. Hey, hey boy, what's the matter? They have been here. The teeth in the night. Oh, no. Not McConaughey. This half reminds me of something. A species I met a while back, they danced in the air like dust, stripped the meat from their prey in seconds. It's never happened so close before. There's usually something left, though. Even if it's just a bone. He came looking for me. Oh, this is my fault. There's nothing you could have done. Not against Vashta Narada. You know what's been taking people. Can you stop them? Two questions, same answer to both. I'm working on it. We should get you home. No argument here. Can you drive? This old tub, no problem. But I reckon we should walk. The teeth are still here. They were here. Inside. Best not to risk it. We'll take the torch. This way to the research center, Doctor. Lead on, super dog. Do us a favor, though. Stay out of the shadows. It's dark, Doctor. Everywhere shadows. Then we'll walk carefully. I'll light the way. I'll help. We've got you. As Josh Sobchak in the chat has said, uh, in Big Finish prior adventures, I think it was classic Doctor's new monsters, the fourth and the eighth Doctor have also met the Vashta Narada. So, you know, it's not stepping on any toes in terms of the TV series continuity. Not that that really matters in the in the broad scheme of things. But Red Darkness is uh, is... It's one hell of a journey, to be honest, and because it's done through the uh, through the perspective predominantly of Callan Lennox, I, Adam Martin, he, he really is like sort of like the proper co-lead of this story. He's in almost every single scene, and not to go into spoilers or anything, but he goes through the absolute ringer here, where you know it's a Vashta Narada slasher story. Like not all of his um, his family and his friends are going to be making it out of of this story, but he really does get put through the ringer here, as does Doyle, who uh, you've you heard in that clip there, his voice brilliantly by Haki Bambra where the two are a great pairing where it's not just um here's a teenager and his assistant's dog no these are proper mates they're proper chums with each other who get on really really well and they have an actual dynamic rapport with each other where they have banter where they argue with each other and they do get short with each other they properly communicate with each other and it's really really effectively done the Vashta Narada as well they're a really great choice for audio and as you can probably tell by the cover as well when it comes to the Vashta Narada they do need an, another way to sort of communicate to the viewer because they were able to communicate with the other characters in their tv appearance because they had the collars because they were uh, they were able to use the spacesuits which they were steering around with the skeletons inside of them in order to communicate with people and Shades of Fear does something quite similar but it doesn't do it in a way that feels like it's just copying the TV appearance it's a it, I'm actually kind of surprised that Roy Gill was able to do that sort of sleight of hand where he's able to sort of take notes from Stephen Moffat's work in series four but not feel like he's copying not feeling like he's relying on that in order to fit the Vashta Narada to the audio medium 
But the main like driving force of the Vashna Narada and the Doctor in the story, you know, you've got all of that stuff. But the main story here is for Cal and Lennox and to try and become an independent teenager because his parents, because he's partially sighted, be his parents and his family don't think he's equipped to do what he, he believes him to be. And he's doing okay. We see him at the beginning of the story and he's scavenging with Doyle. Like He's clearly doing fine. And the Ninth Doctor also picks up on that. He, he, he realizes that, that Cal and um that Callan is not limited in fact because of the way that the red darkness is able to possess people and the way that the red darkness is a threat to the main cast his partial sightedness is actually going to be a strength and is all as well as his um as well as his commitment and his drive. And Adam Martin gives a terrific performance. Like I said, Callan gets put through the ringer in this story, and Adam Martin is able to, to 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 rise to the occasion, to rise to the material. The rest of the cast is great as well. Um, one standout is a character called Bram, who is basically doing the equivalent of Hey Who Turned Out the Lights from The Forest of the Dead. Uh, he's, he's played by Michael Shelford. But the rest of the cast is great as well. The dynamic between Callan and Doyle is really, really memorable it ends in a way that i'm really really excited if they do pick up on any of the loose threads from this serial that would be a really interesting direction for the ninth doctor adventures to take in the near future and my god if it does go in the direction that it could be implying the canon of the ninth doctor is gonna be all blown wide open we have no idea we have no idea when these stories and these serials are gonna be set but it was a really good and genuinely a quite a tense story. Like this is a, a slasher, a horror story with the Vashta Narada as the Jason Voorhees stand in. It was a pretty chilling listen at points, some really dark territory. And yeah, Christopher Eccleston does great as well. Uh, there is a little bit of a bait and switch towards the end, which I think maybe could have been, um, I, I think it could have maybe have been hinted at a little bit more. It just kind of does come a little bit out of nowhere, but I still really appreciated the direction that the story went in. Shades of Fear overall, this was a really solid ending. I think that season two of the Ninth Doctor Adventures overall has been a slight step down from season one, but they've been consistently good stories, consistently varied, but not to try and repeat myself from previous big finish reviews of the ninth doctor i do think that we've kind of maybe maxed out the ninth doctor on his own i think he needs a companion whether it is nova who was the potential companion at the end of ravages where it ends in that cliffhanger and she is now joining him but now maybe not because we're two seasons in and we've not seen or heard from nova since or if you bring back Billy Piper, or maybe even John Barrowman, who knows what's going to be happening with the Ninth Doctor and potential companions. But I do think Big Finish have reached their limit with um, f with eight box sets, with 24 stories of the Doctor on his own, with separate companion surrogates in each story. I think he needs a companion now. I think that's the best way to move forward with the Ninth Doctor. But Shades of Fear was really, really good. The Colour of Terror is the most easy one for me to recommend, but Red Darkness, with the directions it takes, with the, the subject matter, the chilling uh, implementation of the Vastra Narada, it's probably the best one of the three. And The Blooming Menace was also just a really fun, punchy, snap happy historical set in the 1920s it was a really good varied box set overall probably one of my favorites of series two overall but with the ninth doctor adventures page on big finish this is the last one that he's in for the near future so whether or not they're going to be recording more in the near future a season three we know that eccleston is going to be in the 60th anniversary recording scenes with david warner the unbound doctor so that will be interesting but for the future of the ninth doctor range i think he needs a companion now i think you've, you've limited it so for season two let's let's okay right in no particular order the best adventures from doctor who the ninth doctor adventures at season two um old lang syne is the best like hands down salvation nine probably second best red darkness third Uh, Lay Down Your Arms was really good, as was Flat Pack. This was a good set, Hidden Depth. Hidden, Hidden Depth was really good. But yeah, Old Lang Syne and Salvation Nine, those are the best two. Those are the best two stories of the Ninth Doctor Adventure Season 2 and Red Darkness. That's the top three. I'm happy with those, th with those threes. With those three.